Would you turn with me, please, to the passage we read in God's Word, Isaiah chapter 33. And as the Lord would enable us, we might consider together verses 15 to 17. Isaiah 33, verses 15 to 17. Perhaps we might take up the reading at verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire, who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings. And we notice the answer. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defence shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty, they shall behold the land that is very far off. Isaiah 13, verses 15 to 17. Now it would appear that this prophecy was given um, during the reign of King Hezekiah. The Assyrians, who were the great superpower in the Middle East in that time, had been oppressing Judah and they had accepted tribute from um, the people of Judah and then they had come threatening them once more. There were those who spoiled and well after a time of peace they then begin to act treacherously, they break their agreements um, they want some more money and more supplies and that was indeed the situation that faced Hezekiah. You have spoiling and you have treacherous treachery. And in that context we find Isaiah giving a word of encouragement to Hezekiah and to the godly in Jerusalem. He reminds them that God is seeing these things, that God is not ignoring them, but that it is the one who is the just God, he will ultimately deal with those who oppress his people and who act in such a way. And so we read in verse 1, Woe to thee that spoilest and was not spoiled. Well, that was Assyria, that was Nineveh and especially. The, the one who dealt treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. It wasn't as if they were paying back to others the way they had received. Now the Assyrians trampled over nations, would double cross them, they didn't care. They were only out for power and for money and for their own glory. But God's pronouncing a woe upon them. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. When thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. There then is the context in which this prophecy is being given. And in such a context of trouble and concern. We find the Jews crying for help. O oh Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Well, you think of Hezekiah. He had set reforms in place. And he had sought to lead the people of God back to himself. And yet there are still difficulties. And there is this cry for help in the midst of perplexity. And they are looking to the Lord to come. You've got that, verse 2, and in the subsequent verses. And there is this looking. 
to the Lord who has filled Zion with judgment and righteousness and wisdom and knowledge that the Lord will be there, he will be their strength, that the Lord will be their treasure and their help. So they're crying out to help, they know that their only hope is in God. And then in verses 7 to 12, uh, there is this lamentation because despite this looking for help from God, things are not good. Um, the valiant ones are crying outside the city. The ambassadors of peace are weeping bitterly. Well, you think of those who were to go and speak with Rav Shaka, for example, and to try and um, see what could be done to keep peace. And, well, they are just mocked and trashed and God is being abused. And so there is a situation where um, those who are trying to help resolve the situation, they are left helpless, powerless, getting nowhere. And instead, the highways are waste. People are frightened to travel. They're, because these, those who are oppressing have no regard for man, and, well, it's even difficult to continue in a normal um, course of events with agriculture. There's this lament that things are grim. And the Lord meets with them. He says he's going to rise. He's going to be exalted. He comes with a gracious response. And you've got that in verses 10 to 12. And... To those who were ungodly, the Assyrians, they were going to conceive chaff and bring forth stubble. And the Lord was going to deal with them and burn them up in the fire. And so it is that God is one who is a consuming fire. And as that is recognised, you can see that the sinners in Zion are afraid. Well, those who are amongst the Jews, but there's no real sincerity. As they see God's judgments, they too fear. Because God is displaying that he deals impartially with sinners. Whoever they are, are they amongst his, are they amongst his, uh, his church or are they amongst those who are idolaters? doesn't matter. Sin's going to be dealt with. And therefore the question arises, who can stand his justice? Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Is it possible to have fellowship? with and to enjoy the presence of the God who is a consuming fire against sin. And we're told it is. We're told there are those who shall dwell the devouring fire. The answer comes in the words of our text. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from beholding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell in high. His place of defence shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. In other words, there are those who have a relationship with such a holy God and who can know his blessing. Well, let's consider these words as we would seek to prepare our hearts for the coming uh, Lord's Day. And we notice three things that are brought before us in the words of the text. There is, first of all, the character of the saints, those who enjoy fellowship with God. The confidence of the saints. And then thirdly, the contemplation of the saints. First of all, 
we're told about the character of the saints. Here are the people who have a relationship, a blessed relationship, with the holy God who is a consuming fire. And what can we say about them? How can we summarise it? Well, simply this. There are holy people who have, a fel who have fellowship with a holy God. God who is holy will only have fellowship with a holy people. And of course, immediately as we think of such things, we must remember that we are not speaking here of a people who have in any way merited the favour or the blessing of fellowship with God. Isaiah here is not speaking in terms of merit, that these people are the ones who, because they do these things, are able to endure the God who is a consuming fire. Rather, what he's doing is he is delineating for us. He is showing us the character of God's people. And we must remember that he is not speaking here of God's people in terms of perfection. We have to remember as we read a verse like this that we have to maintain that balance that the saints are the people who are a holy people because their hope is in Christ and they rely upon his merit alone for salvation. Their justification is because of what Christ has done alone. And our faith doesn't add to our justification. It's not the basis of it, neither our repentance. It's all Christ's righteousness. We have to remember that and also that he's not speaking in terms of perfection. We have to remember that God's people are a people who find themselves in a spiritual battle day by day. And doesn't Paul bring that out in his epistles? For example, in, in Galatians 5, and he talks about the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There are these contrary influences within the souls of God's people. That the, the God's people are a people who long for holiness. Their desire is to please God. But often they find themselves struggling. Well, it's not that they might be struggled, they might be, find themselves tempted to outwardly sin, they may successfully resist such things, but they're conscious that there's this heart struggle. And that often they're ashamed of themselves. That the good they would do, they do not. And the evil that they would not do, that they do. And he can't we say this, that as we go on as believers, we find the struggle intensifies. Things bother us now that never bothered us before. That growth and holiness... doesn't really seem a reality for God's people because they're more conscious of their imperfections now than they were before. So we have to remember this when he's speaking here in terms of God's people being a holy people. It's not merit he's speaking of and he's not speaking of perfection either. And we notice that in a sense, what we have here is an all-pervasive holiness. That God's people are a people who desire to deal with sin wherever it shows itself. It's not just an outward, outward living. And that outward conversation, in the way we walk, or even in the way we talk, our thoughts bother us as well. We desire to protect our ears and protect our eyes. We make a covenant of our eye, with our eyes. Lest it might be looking on a woman or looking on something else in a wrong way. 
something only God would know. But God does note it. And God's people are concerned about these things. Well, let's notice the description of holiness as we find it here. We're told that the one who enjoys fellowship with God, who dwells with the devouring fire, first thing we're told is he walks righteously. He walks righteously. In other words, he's someone who's straight, whose life is in conformity with the law of God. He will say with the psalmist, Well, how love I thy law? It is my study all the day. Do you love God's law? Do you see that the blessed one is the one who is undefiled, who is straight and upright and desiring to live in a way which conforms to the commandments of God? And why is it put us walk righteously? Well, aren't God's commandments at the centre of his covenant? You think of the covenant of grace as it is offered to us, that expression of the gospel. It tells us that Jesus Christ is a suitable saviour and he is offered to us and we are called to trust in him as the one who alone can deal with our sin. And that same covenant that calls us to place our hope in Christ alone for salvation, that we might know redemption through him, sends us to the law as a way of life for the redeemed people of God. You remember the preface to the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, which have, has um, redeemed thee from the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And then the commandments come. You're my redeemed people. See what I have done for you. This is how I expect my redeemed people to live. And why is it you want to be holy? Is it not because you are thankful for his grace in the gospel? You're aware that you have been delivered from sin. That you might serve God. You've had enough of serving sin. What fruit had you in these things? Whereof you are now ashamed. For the end thereof is death. And you have turned away from these things. And you love God's law. And is it not true that if you're a true believer you will delight in Christ? And the more you think of Christ, the more it leads you to hate sin because you know it was your sin that nailed him to the cross. And the more you think of what Christ has done for you, the more you long to please him. You know you're not your own. You're bought with a price. And you want to glorify God therefore. So who's the one? Who can have fellowship with the Lord? He's one who walks righteously. Are you walking righteously? And are you motivated in that walk by God's gracious covenant and by the Christ who is at the centre of that covenant? You know, there's a second thing, aspect of this holiness. He walks righteously and he speaketh uprightly. Well, do you speak uprightly? <coughs> do you love holiness? And especially do you love <coughs> holy speech? Is honesty in the way you speak and in the way you think of others? Something that you're concerned about? You see, the one who dwells with the Lord is one who speaks uprightly. He loves holiness. The ninth commandment, the thought of bearing false witness, is something that would trouble him. And therefore he's careful 
about what he says. He is fearful of distorting the truth. Why? Because he knows God's the God of truth and he loves God as the God of truth. He knows that, well, if God wasn't the God of truth, he could have no lasting hope himself. God's not the God of truth. He might change his mind. He might decide after all, what Christ has done isn't enough, but that can't be the case. He's the God who's consistent. He's a God of truth. He's fully reliable. And as God is a God of truth, so we come to love the truth and be thankful for his faithfulness. And we long to be like him. He speaks righteously. Well, that's God's people. A third thing. He despises the gain of oppressions. We were well used to the oppressor in Jerusalem. If it wasn't one nation, it was another nation that was oppressing and spoiling. Now what sort of people do that? Let's go on a raiding party. Let's go and raid the people down the road. See what spoil we can get for ourselves. It wasn't that long ago. That was a common thing in our own land. Raiding parties, rustling. One clan fighting against another clan. Let's see how we can benefit. The believer, someone who despise, despises the gain of the oppressor. You see, the oppressor's out for himself. Perhaps it was a day when you were out for yourself. Life revolved around you and what you could get and how you could get on in the world. And yes, you would trample over others to perhaps get a better position and work. Or in some other way to gain things. But grace has changed that, is it not? Don't you love others? Aren't you concerned for others? You know that you have been loved when you deserved God's wrath. And as God has shown mercy to you, so you are merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Well, is your life centered around yourself? Do you love your neighbour as yourself? Do you? Because those who dwell with the Lord are those who they are concerned for the physical, mental and spiritual well-being of others. They don't have the attitude, I'm all right. It's me that matters. A fourth thing, you'll notice that he shakes his hands from holding of bribes. In other words, here's someone who can't be bribed. In fact, this person is indignant at the very thought that he could be offered a bribe. Isn't God the God who is just? Because God is just, you want to be just. And you know that perhaps a little bribery, or a little favouritism might even get you further at times, but no, you'll not be like that. Because God is not like that. This person wants to be like him. You'll notice also he stops his ears from hearing of blood. All the stories of violence and war. But exciting. But this man doesn't think that. He stops his ears from the hearing of blood. He doesn't want to hear of violence. He recoils at such a thing. Are you gentle? Are you a gentle person? Have you learned what it is to be meek? And are you becoming 
more meek. Remember the Lord Jesus. A bruised reed he shall not break, and smoking flax he shall not quench. Or to think of the kindness of Christ to us, and what he has saved us from. It's not violence. On I shall seek to be gentle. Perhaps part of the problem of the day and age in which we live is that even things like that we get so used to. Books, films, full of violence. Yes, if we actually saw it in the flesh, I'm sure we would recoil differently. But even thinking of such things, this man's shocked about it. Shocked about it. Even what's said in the news, he wouldn't want to hear these things. No. There's a meekness and a gentleness and a living for Christ. Indeed, we read, he shuts his eyes from seeing evil. In other words, he can't look in sin indifferently. Are you bothered? When you see people sinning, how many ignore? How many feast on sin almost and delight in sin? But God's people, they cannot ignore it. They know God hates sin. And as God has no delight in sin, so the believer has no delight in sin. Rather, the believer is someone who is broken. By his own sin. And even when he sees others going on in sin, not keeping God's law, it reminds him of past folly and exposes even his present failings himself. And he cannot but mourn and grieve. And yet, what does Scripture tell us? To this man will I look. Here's the one I will be with and a fellowship with him that is humble and of a contrite heart, and who trembleth at my word. That's the character of the saints. They're a holy people. They're not perfect, but the desires are holiness. And if we are like this, then we have the hope of being able to have fellowship with them. Because these are the ones who dwell with the devouring fire, with the God who is certainly a devouring fire to his enemy, but who delights in the salvation of sinners. Secondly, we must move on. The confidence of the saints. The confidence of the saints. God's people, they are those who do not trust in themselves. Well, they trust in God. And we can see from verse 16 that the believer is someone who has found a place of security in God. And that this place of security is something which is provided for him because we read, he shall dwell in high, but bread shall be given him. And well, what we're seeing is that his confidence is in what God does for him. And of course, that comes out by these prayers and these desires for the Lord to be gracious. We have waited for thee. Be thou the arm of the morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. Verse 2. Where is our confidence? Well, the world has its confidence in its own abilities and in the plans of world leaders, but the believer, his confidence is in the Lord. He finds security and confidence in God even in dark days. And you can see two things in his verse that God's people, first of all, have security. Where he, he shall dwell on high. His place of defence shall be the munitions of rocks. And the picture is of some rocky pinnacle. 
Now, you may have seen some of the pictures of the parts of the wilderness in, uh, of Judah. And there are areas where there are sheer cliffs almost. And it would be virtually impossible for an invader or an attacker to scale that cliff and attack. There are, so the, this place of security is a place that is on high. His defense are the munitions of the rocks. It's something a lot better, say, than Edinburgh Castle Rock, if you think of that. There is security. Because he finds a place that it's impossible for the enemy to reach. And friend, do we not have complete security in God? He is our confidence. And he being our God, we'll look to him. To maintain that peace we have with him. And we'll look to the God who is gracious to provide us certainly everlasting security in his covenant that he will preserve us because we are weak ourselves and that he will keep us from falling and ultimately present us before the presence of his glory with great joy in coming to Christ we have found a saviour who is complete, who will keep us because we know we cannot keep ourselves. Our confidence, is it not in the Lord? You know, when the devil comes and reminds you of your own weakness and your own failings, you begin to feel dismayed and you perhaps wonder, Will I even persevere in the faith? Are there not dangers and difficulties? Well, it's good to be aware of these things. But remember, your confidence is in the Lord. And you dwell in a place where there is ultimate security. None can pluck you from the hands of the Saviour. My Father is greater than me. None can pluck them from my Father's hands. I and my Father are one. Bound in the hands of the triune God, we are secure forever. And not only that, this person has supplies. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Now, there's bread and water. What more do you need? bread and water. In other words, all that you need is to be found in Christ. And can't we say that, well, that's true. The believer, he finds his confidence in the Lord, and he knows that all that he needs is to be found in Christ, and he finds a satisfaction in Christ alone. He is the one who will satisfy us and keep us. Now, if you think of that mountain pinnacle in the wilderness of Judah, it's a great place to go to escape from an enemy. But there's a certain problem. What's the problem? You're not going to have food supplies and you're not going to have water. There's probably no water anyway. If there is any water, it will be down in the valley and the desert wadis if they fill up with water after a storm. You're certainly not going to get some water. You wouldn't climb up onto the pinnacle of the mountain. But is it not true that for God's people, as they flee to Christ, and as they look to him for help in days of danger, as we 
look to the Lord to keep us, especially in days of trials and dark times, we actually find he does keep us. He does prove faithful. He doesn't let us down. There are supplies there. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. We do find that, well, he even causes our cup to overflow when we're surrounded by the enemy. And he certainly is with us in the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't leave us. He provides for us there. We find that God is for us. We find that our tears at times are meat. When trouble comes, and there's times when we can testify, it was good that I was afflicted, for now I trust thy word. The Lord was with me, he kept me, he sustained me, he provided for me, he brought blessing through those difficulties. We have security, we have supplies in God. We look to the Lord to keep us. And we know that troubles may come. But the Lord will keep us in the middle of these things. So here's the believer. One who is holy. And one who has confidence in God. But then a third thing we notice is this. The contemplation of the saints. They're told, Thine eyes shall see the king and his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. There's this promise of the king and of seeing the king and his beauty. Now, it may be an allusion to Hezekiah in some way being restored, that no longer would he be seen in sackcloth, but he would be seen as one would want to see the king with his glorious robes on. But if there is an allusion to Hezekiah, it's looking beyond these things, and it is looking to Christ, the greater king, and whose kingdom is a greater kingdom than that merely of the kingdom of Judah. What does the world hope for? The world's hopes are focused on the things of the world. What do you want more of? Do you want to know? Surely if you're a believer, you want to know more of Christ. And you want to contemplate him. And your focus is on Christ and his kingdom. And your longings are to see more of the king and to see more of his kingdom. And here's this promise. To those who are the godly, who find a security and their confidences in God alone, that their eyes shall see the king in his beauty, they shall behold the land that is very far off. They shall see the king. They shall see the king who humbled himself much more than Hezekiah humbled himself. Oh yes, Hezekiah was in sackcloth. And you think of how Christ wore the sackcloth of our nature. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He is there with a sinless and yet you can see a weakened humanity. And his glory is veiled over. And there's a greater humiliation than that because he humbles himself and becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You think of all the sufferings. And they were all for you, dear believer. But our king... He is now exalted gloriously. Is that not true? We remember, he was degraded. 
We remember that he was put to shame. We remember that he humbled himself and suffered once for all for our sins. But oh, we rejoice that he is now exalted at the right hand of God. And oh, we long to see the king in his beauty. Perhaps we don't contemplate enough Christ as he is now as the glorious enthroned King of the nations and Lord over all. It's good for us to remember that he is exalted and glorious and beautiful. And dear believer, don't you long to see him as the one who was crucified, but is now exalted to glory. Don't you long to see him in the fullness of his beauty? When you enter glory or when he comes again and you see him, well, there's the hope of heaven, is it not, to see him in the beauty of his glory as King of kings and Lord of lords and as the King and Head and Bridegroom of his church. Oh, you'll never forget that he's like that because he willingly humbled himself. He is rewarded with that great reward that he deserves because of his obedience. You never forget the cross. Well, of course we never do. But you will see him as the one who is now glorious and rejoice in him. Isn't that what we contemplate? Yes, we remember him crucified. We're told to remember his death till he comes again. And we'll never forget his death once he comes. But we remember that he is no more dead. He is risen. He is glorious. He is exalted. And we rejoice in that fact. We'd have no salvation if he was not exalted and glorious. The very fact he is exalted and glorious is a proof he's dealt with sin. So we contemplate the king. The lamb that was slain was now in the midst of the throne. And though we also contemplate his kingdom, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Well, aren't we concerned for the kingdom of Christ? Is it not your daily prayer? Thy kingdom come. And you pray for and you long for the coming of that kingdom. You long to see the kingdom growing through time. Are there not times when you think, what would it be like if this person was converted? If, our, if revival broke out in our cities and our nation, throughout the nations of the earth? Think of it. What would it be like? When kings are nursing fathers and nursing mothers to the church. And days of great blessing come when Jew and Gentile, the Jewish world, the Muslim world, all acknowledging Christ. No longer in Judaism. But those who acknowledge Christ the Messiah. And all those nations given over to false religion, bowing before Christ. What a glorious thing that will be. And then you look beyond that to Christ coming, ushering in that new heavens and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. That kingdom of glory coming. There's the climax of his kingdom. And you can see this kingdom how glorious it is. They, they, they shall behold the land that is very far off. Now, the picture may be of it being extensive. It's a land of distances, literally. It may be that 
is stressing the everlasting nature of this kingdom. Do we often contemplate these things? We think of the triumph of the kingdom of grace below. We think of the glory of the kingdom of glory that is to come. And the joy and the peace that will be there. Is that not what we contemplate? The world is living for tomorrow. Is living for, for whatever little pleasure it might get out of the next entertainment there is. Or perhaps a longing to hear of some economic or climate problem being solved and thinks that's great. Well, we know there are problems that might need solving in this world. But we've got much better things to contemplate. The believer, his character is holy. His confidence is in God. He contemplates Christ in his kingdom. And we're told, the person who's like that, if you're like that, the one who's the holy God, the one who is a devouring fire, well, he's that to his enemies, but he's not that to his friends, that to his people, that to his redeemed. And we can draw near daily. And we can draw near at his table with confidence, knowing that one day we shall be with him in glory and there enjoy his presence as never before. May God help us to search our hearts, to see if we are amongst these people. And may we be found amongst those who have the character of saints, whose confidence is in God, and to contemplate Christ and his kingdom. Let us pray.